name is Scott Lowe. I'm a principal with Toronto Consulting Services. We're going to talk today about analyzing a schedule for delay. <clears throat> this follows up on some previous sessions where we talked about basic scheduling terms, about the concept of float, and we introduced the idea that one of the things we're going to have to do in our schedule analysis is determine when an activity no longer has float, its float has been consumed, and the project is now being delayed. Now, there's two basic perspectives to have when you're talking about analyzing uh, a delay to determine whether or not it's going to delay the project completion date. And we're going to talk about delays of project completion date here. You could have delays to interim milestones, and they're important. There are oftentimes are liquidated damages or other costs associated with delays to interim milestones. But just to keep it simple, today we're going to focus on delays to the project, which is probably the most common occurrence in any event. One of the perspectives that's important is a perspective from before the delay occurs. Now, we don't always have, aren't lucky enough to be able to view a delay from the perspective of before it happens. In other words, we don't necessarily know a delay is coming down the pike. It just happens and by the time we realize it, we're already past the point where the delay has started. So the second perspective would be viewing a delay after the delay has occurred and trying to measure its impact on the project. We're going to focus in this discussion on delays to the project that we're forecasting in the future. In other words, we're going to try and evaluate the delay before we actually experience it. And clearly from a project management perspective, that's the situation we want to be in, a situation where we can forecast that there's going to be a problem and address the problem before it ever happens. Uh, typically, for example, if you were an owner and you had to make a change, one of the things you'd like to know is what are the consequences of that change going to be on the schedule. And if necessary, if it's going to necessitate a schedule time extension, you want to give it the time extension before uh, the delay even occurs and certainly when you issue the change order. Don't wait till the end of the project to get time extensions. You'll, as an owner, you'll often get yourselves in a constructive acceleration situation, which we're not going to talk about in this session, but kind of an introduction to future sessions. Um, so the preferred mode here will be to evaluate delays before they occur. That's what we're going to try and do. We're not always going to be able to do it, but that's what we'd like to be able to do. So let me set the stage. Um, let's say we have a bridge. And let's say we decide that in executing this project, this bridge project, we're going to run into, we discover after we've already started construction, we're going to run into a problem with attaining access to construct our cofferdam in the river for one of the bridge piers. And because of that, we're envisioning that the project is going to be a delay. It's an environmental issue, fish are spawning in the river, and we can't go into the river while that activity is taking place. So from an environmental perspective, we're being precluded uh, from working in the river. And this was not noted in the contracts. Neither party, neither the owner, nor the contractor were aware of it. Uh, and this is something that's discovered once construction begins. And what we want to figure out is what are the consequences to the project going to be that, in fact, we uh, aren't going to be able to get into the river and construct one of the coffer dams when we'd hope. So this slide here refers, you can see the bridge itself, and you can see here the pile foundations for which we'll require um, a cofferdam to construct. Now, this next slide is the baseline schedule. Basically is the schedule in place uh, for the purposes of our discussion at the beginning of the project. Okay? So how, how would you know a baseline schedule? A baseline schedule, the as plan schedule, is a schedule that exists before any work is performed. Oftentimes we say that we'd like that schedule to be the earliest complete and approved project schedule. In other words, we want it to be the earliest complete schedule for the project that all the parties to the contract have agreed to. It essentially represents the project team's plan for building the project. Now, if you look at this particular uh, baseline schedule, you'll see that it lays out particular activities for the construction of the bridge. You'll see some black bars. Those black bars represent the critical activities. And you'll also see that the original contract completion date, excuse me, the original scheduled project completion date 
in this particular schedule is July 13th. Okay. Now, the change is that on February 1, we discover that the Crawford Dam construction cannot actually start until March, much later than we'd anticipated. We're not in March, so the delay hasn't happened yet. We're only on February, oh well, we're only or early in the project, so we are in a position where we can evaluate the impact of this delay before we actually get there. Now, how do we do that? Well, the technique that one would use sometimes is given a name. It's sometimes called time impact analysis. Uh, unfortunately, the term time impact analysis these days is used to describe lots of different schedule analysis techniques. So I'm, I'm not sure it's a precise enough term anymore to call it that. But basically, it's a forward-looking analysis that uh, requires the dropping in of fragments into the schedule to show how those added work, these added requirements, affect the project completion date. Okay? So I, I use some probably new terms for you. Fragment is one of them, a fragmentary network. That's basically a mini schedule of the change. So what we're doing is we're going to drop into our project schedule a little schedule that represents the change. Okay, now how do we do that? Well, the process or procedure is, as we indicate in this slide right here, the process or the procedure is to identify the work activities that are affected by the change, to determine the schedule for the new work, that, that's the fragment, the mini schedule, to identify the contemporaneous schedule, in other words, the schedule that's in place at the time we realized that the change needs to be added to the work. So we realized on February 1 that we needed to evaluate the consequences of not being able to work in the river uh, until March. And so what we're looking for is the status, the schedule that shows the status of the project on February 1. So we'll have to update our baseline schedule that shows the status of the project in January to February 1 so that it accurately represents the status of the project at the time that the delay is recognized. In part, we always want to evaluate delays in the contemporaneous schedule, the schedule that's in effect at the time the delay is recognized or occurs. <clears throat> so the process we're going to use here is, and you can see this in the next schedule, is that we're going to first update the baseline schedule and bring the status up to February 1. And you can see now that the project completion date, looking at the next slide, is July 19th. The next thing we want to do is we want to adjust this updated schedule for the change. In other words, we want to insert the change into the schedule. And the next slide shows the logic that we're going to use and what it looks like. Uh, this next slide gives it a little bit more detail so you can see exactly what we did. Essentially what we did is we put in an activity that represented the environmental restriction as a predecessor to the work associated with the construction of the coffer dam. And because it falls in front of the coffer dam, the coffer dam work cannot occur until later than the original schedule had envisioned. Now, when you look at the schedule that's now been adjusted for the change, you see that the project completion date has been pushed out to July 22nd. Now, if you recall, in a previous slide, the February 1 schedule updated without the change predicted a completion date of July 19th. So, if the predicted completion date of the project without the change is July 19th, and when I put the change into the schedule, the predicted completion date of the project is now July 22nd. We know that the consequences of inserting this change into the project is that the project completion date has been pushed out three days. There's been a three-day delay associated with the restrictions uh, on working in the river uh, until March. So, sort of summarizing here, this time impact analysis approach that I've described, or this fragment type of analysis that I've described, works very simply. Identify the change, develop a little miniature fragment for that change, identify the date when the change needs to be inserted into the schedule, 
update the schedule to that point so you'll know the status of the project at the time you insert the change, insert the change in the updated schedule, and look to see what the consequences are. If there is no consequence, then essentially what's happened is the change has consumed flow on the path, but it has not actually delayed the project completion date. Likewise, perhaps the change, you put in a change that's only a few days, but it caused a project completion date to move out many days. That might be because it's now pushed you over a winter shutdown period or pushed you over some other milestone or restriction on the performance of work on the project. So the actual delay associated with the project may be very different than the duration of the fragment that you inserted. Some other considerations when you're looking at this kind of an approach. Number one, you sort of have to know the exact scope of the work. In other words, I have to know the restriction on uh, the environmental restrictions on starting cofferdam construction. You sort of have to know the duration of the work. And in this case, I needed to know when that environmental restriction was lifted. And if I knew that information, or I could come up with a reasonable estimate, then typically I could come up with a fragment, a little miniature schedule that describes the work. Now, it is possible that we don't know the scope of the work. We don't know how long it's going to take. Or in some cases, you may have a situation where it's not even work. In other words, it's kind of an absence of work. For example, maybe the contractor receives a stop work order. Don't do this anymore but there's no indication as to when the stop work order will be lifted, and there's no indication as to why the stop work order is issued. For example, maybe the stop work order is issued because there's a design error, and the owner now has to work through the problem and figure out how to correct the design so that the contractor can continue working. That kind of a delay is hard to analyze using a fragment because you don't know the duration in advance. So oftentimes, that kind of a delay would not be evaluated by inserting a fragment. Matter of fact, some owners have actually specified that fact. In other words, one way to understand how the owner uh, by contract is requiring the schedule analysis to occur is to literally read the contract time extension provision and see what it says about how delays are to be evaluated. Some contracts will actually describe the process I just described to you. Probably not as much detail, but basically they're going to say you should evaluate the delay in the schedule that's current at the time the delay occurs. And they may even make reference to a time impact analysis or make reference to a fragment or the use of a fragment to measure the delay. <clears throat> Another consideration is that this whole analysis technique I just described presumes that the delay is in the future. It hasn't happened yet. So when we put it in the, the, the fragment into the schedule, essentially what we're saying is, this is what I anticipate is going to happen. And the comparison that's being performed is essentially a comparison between what I'm estimating is going to happen associated with the change and, what I'm, and the rest of my project plan. In other words, it's all planned. It's what I plan for the change to affect the change. Uh, the effect I expect the change to have on the project, plus how I expect or plan for the project to unfold. None of it's actual information. This is all information that is anticipated. It's projected into the future. Now, if I get to the end of the project and I think there's been a delay, and I want to use this technique to evaluate the delay, and I use its actual durations for the change, and I put in actual information that I then compare, in other words, I construct a fragment with actual information, actual durations, actual logic, actual actual, and I put that information in the schedule, I no longer necessarily have a comparison between what I'm planning to do and on the project and what I'm planning to do on the change. I now have a comparison between what I actually did on the change and what I plan to do on the project. And there, I think is it a concern that that comparison um, may be unfair sometimes. In other words, we're comparing apples to oranges, actual information to uh, what was planned. So while the approach that I've just described works great from a uh, 
projecting the future perspective. And it's a very common and readily acceptable approach. It's not so useful when looking at the work uh, from behind, in other words, after the building has occurred. It's, it's, it's less convincing, perhaps. It may be less successful. You may have more problems convincing the other parties that it's an appropriate technique to use. And there may be other techniques that are more appropriate to use, which we will discuss in the next session. Thank you.